So the main goal of this next section is going to be introducing variables that we're going to use to describe rotational motion, but making sure that we understand that really there's nothing new here. What you're going to see is what we've dealt with so far in terms of talking about what we'll relabel as translational motion. All that basically still applies to when we're talking about rotational motion. So for starters, just when we say translational motion, what we basically mean is how an object moves through space. And so you can start by talking about an object's position as it does that. With rotational motion, we're going to talk about how an object spins about some point. And again, you can start by talking about its angular position. Now what we saw was it's particularly useful in terms of translational motion to talk about the displacement. It moved from some position to some final position. Well, we can talk about the angular displacement. That's basically what angle did your object rotate through. And in the same sense that both of these for translational motion have units of meters, both of these for rotational motion have units of radians. Radians are going to be the units that we use to describe angular position and angular displacement. Now we know that with translational motion, when you start talking about how the position changes with respect to time, then you're talking about the velocity. And again, we can talk about that on average by simply knowing, well, what was the change in position over some discrete chunk of time? Or we can talk about the instantaneous velocity, which tells you the derivative of the position function with respect to time. All that still carries over for angular velocity. So again, this is a lowercase Greek letter omega. You will probably refer to it as w, but it's actually an omega. And again, we can talk about the angular velocity on average by saying, well, what what was the object's angular displacement over some chunk of time? Or we can talk about the instantaneous angular velocity, which again says if you know what its angular position is as a function of time, you can take its derivative. Now, the units for velocity were meters per second when we were talking about translational motion. Take the units of position, divide by time. The units of angular velocity are radians per second. So again, our angular position, radians, divided by time. Well, if you want to talk about how the velocity changes, in translational motion, we said, well, you want to pay attention to the acceleration. And again, we could talk about the acceleration on average. Tell me what the change of velocity is over some chunk of time. And we could talk about the instantaneous acceleration by again saying, well, if I know what the velocity is as a function of time, I can take its derivative with respect to time, and that's going to give me a function that describes the object's acceleration. The units for acceleration we're getting meters per second squared, so meters per second per second. Angular acceleration plays the same role. So again, it's going to tell you how the angular velocity is changing. It can tell you that on average by, by simply knowing how the angular velocity changed between two points in time and taking delta omega over delta t. Or again, if you know omega as a function of time, then taking the derivative of omega with respect to time will give you a function that describes the instantaneous angular acceleration alpha. Units for angular acceleration, radians per second per second, or radians per second squared. So again, sort of everything we used in describing translational motion maps over in talking about rotational motion. Now one of the details that we did emphasize was that of course translational motion, all of these quantities are vectors. And so we want to think about how these things matter in terms of their direction as well. So if I have an object that's able to spin, one of the things in terms of keeping track of our angular quantities as vectors is I need to recognize that that rod as it's spinning rotates about an axis that in this case points into and out of the page. Here's the pivot point that that rod can rotate around and there's an axis that runs through that point that comes out out of the screen towards you and into the screen away from you so that the axis of rotation for this particular rod the way it's drawn happens to lie along the z-axis. For our rotational motion problems, they're vector problems, but what we're going to do is we're going to focus on one-dimensional vector problems because we're basically going to say, as vectors, 
all those quantities are either going to point in the positive z or in the negative z. So we're going to treat these as one-dimensional vector problems where all of our vector quantities, angular displacement, angular velocity, angular acceleration, they lie along the axis of rotation. How are we going to determine whether or not a rotational quantity points into or out of the page, or into or out of the screen, or into or out of the board? Right? So into or out of some plane in which we're watching an object rotate. And the answer is we're going to use a right-hand rule. What we'll see with rotational motion is that there's going to be a whole series of right-hand rules. And so the first one's going to help us figure out the direction of angular displacement and angular velocity. Again, if we think about this rod as it rotated, so it rotated counterclockwise, what we want to do is we want to start by taking our right hand, and then we're going to curl the fingers of our right hand in the direction the object is rotating. So take your right hand and hold it up to the screen and hold it so that you curl your fingers counterclockwise the way that rod rotates. What you notice is the thumb of your right hand is pointing out towards you. So what that means is that when you curl the fingers of your right hand in the direction the object rotates, the thumb of your right hand points in the direction of the object's angular displacement and angular velocity. So in this case, what we'd say is that the angular displacement and angular velocity of this rod as it rotates counterclockwise points out towards us. So the angular displacement points out, the angular velocity points out. So the question becomes, well, how are we going to show that? Again, we've gotten used to the fact that vectors, we draw them like an arrow to show both magnitude and direction. And so when we're talking about things that are coming out of the plane or going into the plane, we still want to think of it as an arrow. It's just that as it comes out of the plane, you can think of this as we're drawing the tip of the arrow pointing straight towards you. And here, we're drawing the back end of the arrow as it goes away. So we're still thinking of, of a vector as being represented by an arrow. It's just that the way that we're going to notate that in terms of, of drawing it out when we have to deal with it in three dimensions where something's coming into or out of the plane is we're either going to use this dot telling us that it's coming out of the plane or we're going to use the X saying that it's going in. So we've got a right hand rule that's going to tell us the direction of the angular displacement, the direction of the angular velocity. What about angular acceleration? And again the rule that we had with translational acceleration was well, is your object speeding up or slowing down? And of course, that same rule applies here. Is your object rotating faster or slower as it spins? So if your object is rotating at a constant speed, that's going to tell us that we have an angular acceleration of zero. On the other hand, if your object rotates faster as it spins, that means that the angular acceleration has to point in the same direction as the angular velocity. If the object slows down as it spins, then the angular acceleration points in the opposite direction of the velocity. So if what we said was that this rod as it spins counterclockwise is spinning faster and faster and faster, then we would use our right hand rule to say, okay, then I know the angular velocity when I curl the, the fingers of my right hand with the direction the rod's spinning, my thumb points out, which tells me that the angular velocity points out. And the fact that it's speeding up says that the angular acceleration points out as well.